counted among the outlaws. He said, come, follow me. People from all walks of life since have been becoming outlaws. Elvis Presley, known as the king of rock and roll, one of the most cultural, significant figures of the 20th century. Elvis has been inducted into five Hall of Fames, rock and roll, country, gospel, rockabilly, and R&B. He has sold over 1 billion records. He's had over 150 different albums and singles certified gold, platinum, and multi-platinum. He still holds the record for the most top 40 hits at 114. He starred in 31 feature films and two concert documentaries. He won three Grammys, and they were all for gospel music. Elvis had 53 top 40 albums on the Billboard Top 200 chart. His Elvis Aloha from Hawaii, which was the global satellite concert, first time ever done, seen in 40 countries, that was watched by more people than watched the first man on the moon. Elvis is the only music artist to be honored with two U.S. Postal Service commemorative stamps, which years ago I bought the 1993 one in 1993, a bunch of them, and I framed them. I have them someplace. Another in 2015, and that 1993 stamp, which is iconic today, is still the most popular U.S. commemorative stamp of all time. Elvis had one child, Lisa Marie. Soon after he came back from the service, he ended up having three stepbrothers. Not only three stepbrothers, they weren't in the background. They were a major part of his life and vice versa. As a matter of fact, there seems to be, from this latest book I just read, one of the most important things to Elvis was to be a good brother to these stepbrothers and did not consider them stepbrothers, but actual brothers. Thanks, Ken. Great to be here. Growing up with Elvis, we, we come from a strict military background. When my mom divorced uh, my dad and married Vernon, and the first night we met him, we did, my brothers and I, we didn't know who he was because, like I said, we come from a strict military background. We didn't have a radio. We had a radio, but they didn't listen to Elvis, and we didn't have a TV, so I, and we, I never saw any of his movies, so I had no idea who he was. And then we walk into the house, that night he's shooting pool and he sees us and he walks over and says, daddy, what have we got here? And he said, these are your new little brothers. And he picks all three of us up. We were so small. He could pick all three of us up at one time. He picked us up and he said, daddy, always one little brother. And I have three. And we just, I didn't know who he was, but I just thought, man, this guy's kind of neat. And the what next was day, the age, what was your age then? And where was he at in his career? I was seven years old and he just come out of the army. He got home in March and we did, we moved in to Graceland in March. So right shortly after he came out. So he was 25 and I was seven years old and my brother Rick was six and my youngest brother, David was four. So he tucked us in that bed that night and he said, he led us in a prayer before he put us in bed. And then the next day we didn't know he wasn't really an early more in person, but the next day he came in early and it was like a fire drill. Come on, boys, you gotta go, gotta go. And we started looking for clothes. We was gonna change out of our pajamas. He said, you don't have time for that. So he takes David and puts David up on his shoulders and grabs me and Rick by the hands and takes us in the backyard. And then there's three of every kind of toy you can think of. He had a store opened up that night and then bought all these toys for us. And I was, I looked up at him like, this guy's Santa Claus. <laughs> And that was the beginning of our relationship with him. That's how he welcomed us to the family. And when I was growing up, and especially after I became to realize who he was uh, in my teenage years, and even up, I was 24 when he passed away. But when I, sometimes we'd get, we'd kneel at the end of, at the end of his bed, cause sometimes he'd call us up to talk to him and he'd be reading his Bible or something. And then he'd just feel like praying and he, we, he would get on his knees at the, on the edge of his bed and, or beside his bed and lead us in prayer. I'm, I'm just going, if the world could see this guy right here, right now, this is the guy I grew up with. Cause it, there's been so much said about him since he passed away. And it, it just seems like all anybody wants to do is focus on the negative things. Elvis was a Christian. I'm just going to say it. just, he was a Christian. Was he perfect? No, but who is? Mm -hmm. 
when I say this, I would love to just say, okay, those without sin cast the first stone, okay? But they, what it is about people that become successful or something, and then the media and other people want to tear them down. For what? The guy was a good guy. People always ask, well, the generosity, man. He just gave. But it's world famous. It says in the Bible, the Lord loves a generous giver. Elvis was the most generous giver I've ever met in my life. He gave cars, money, and stuff to people he never knew. Who does that? One of the things Elvis loved to do every day was just to, in Memphis, he could get out and ride around, and what which he did almost every day, either on a motorcycle or in his car. So one day he said, let's go for a ride, Billy. And I said, okay. He said, so I had to run upstairs and grab his wallet. And I put it in my briefcase and he and I just were riding around. It was just, he was, he loved to just look at how, how Memphis is growing and all this stuff like that. And we passed this homeless guy and he makes a U-turn. And as he makes the U-turn, he says, hand me the money. Now, when I talk about Elvis' wallet, it was so thick with money, you couldn't fold it. <laughs> So I said, how much? He said, all of it. Okay. So I take it all and I take, he takes it, tucks it down between his legs and we pull up to the gentleman. He rolls the window down and the, at, the guy looks at it and he, Mr. Presley, he said, yes. He said, please call me, please call me overseas. And he started going off about, oh man, I used to have all your records. I've seen all your movies. And I said, that's enough about me, sir. He said, let's talk a little bit about you right now. He goes, okay. I said, so what's going on with in your life right now? Oh, I just hit a little rough patch. Everything's going to get better. I'm walking down here to the unemployment office. I should be getting a job here pretty soon. And Elvis said, I'm sure your luck's going to change, sir. And he reaches out and he's got the money in his hand to shake hands with the gentleman. And the guy puts his hand out and then he sees that money. He takes the money. He's looking at it. He said, no, uh, Mr. Presley. He said, no. I said, please call me Elvis. He said, I can't take this. He said, yes, you can. This is my way of repaying you for watching all those silly movies and buying all my records. And the guy started choking up and I'm sitting there getting choked up. And he said, God bless you, Mr. Presley. He said, sir, he already has. And we drove away and I'm sitting there crying like a baby going, I've never seen anything like this. Elvis. He said, what's the use of having it, Billy, if you can't share it with your fellow man? Yeah, that was it. So he would read the Bible to my brothers and I, but he would do more than just read. He would act out the part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you talk about a Bible lesson you'll never forget. He could give you one, I promise you. <laughs> but he would get so wrapped up in it. I mean, everybody talks about being on tour with Elvis and stuff like that. But the one thing that went with Elvis everywhere he went, when he went on tour was a Bible. He took, even though the hotel might have a Bible. He carried it with him. And it was either my job or my brother Rick or David's job to carry that Bible and make sure it was sitting next to his bed, stand, uh, sitting on his bed stand at night. Cause he read the Bible. I can't tell you how many times he read through the whole Bible and he, he constantly read through it. Anytime he felt like everybody knows about all the problems that he had and stuff like that, but that's where he got his comfort was reading from that right there. Okay. The sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what, that's drugs. all, that's all everybody talks about. That's why I wanted to do this book here to give another, they've only talked about one side of Elvis. They don't talk about the complete Elvis. And that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to show the world with this book was there was more to the guy than what you just heard. There was a lot more to it. You're 19 years old. And all of a sudden now the world is right there in the palm of your hand. What, how would it affect you? Nobody says, no, not even presidents say, nobody says no to you. Right. So wh how would that affect your life? And if, I was you can contact, if you can contact the White House and say, I'm coming for a visit. It was just a spur of the moment type thing too. It was actually him and Priscilla got into a disagreement about how much money he was spending during Christmas. And he got upset and just took off in a car. And then while he was driving in a car, I go, I think I'm going to go see President Nixon. <laughs> he didn't have any money. He had to write an IOU when he got to the ticket counter at American Airlines. And then he writes his long letter while he's on the plane to go see Nixon because he, wa he wanted it get to get his DEA badge. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's how it all happened. It was just a spur of the moment. It wasn't planned. He, it just, okay, that's what I'm going to go do. But like I said, Nixon, he saw it. 
It wasn't like, oh, you're going to have to wait, Mr. Presley. Oh, well, let me give us the, give him the note and we'll get back to you. <laughs> that is how it was all handled. And they did. They called him that night. Wow. Elvis always told me, he t we was watching the thing about Vietnam. He said, well, there's another war going on. I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, the war within. He said, you got the devil on one shoulder and you got God on the other shoulder. He said, and the battle's right here and you're hit. But he said, so who's going to win this? And I said, I, I choose to go with the Lord. He said, yes, he's a good answer, Billy. He said, but with all the temptations and everything. And he said, that's, I mean, perfect example was his favorite chapter verse in the Bible was God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He said, that's how much, see, but he would talk about, he wouldn't really, when he talked about the Bible, he would talk about God's love, that he loves us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins, Billy. And he said, we all fall short. No, He said, no matter what good deeds you do on this earth, it's nothing to God. It's what you believe with all your heart and soul. And he did. But it's aggravating to me when I hear people get up there and talk about, if he loved the Lord so much, how come he did this? And this? I, I, I always go, are you a Christian? Do you understand anything about Christianity at all? And they usually, when they say no, I say, let me explain something to you. And then I start explaining what it's all about. And then, then they'll either, oh, I didn't know that. Or yeah. I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to dwell on his faults. Don't do that. First off, you don't need to be looking at somebody's faults anyway. You should be looking right. at the good. <laughs> yeah, don't, right. don't ever just focus on what they did wrong because who in the world hasn't done wrong? So when you're a believer, you can sense uh, the spirit in other believers. He knew that his gift was a gift from God. And I always say, how many rock concerts do you ever go to? And in the middle of it, there's two gospel songs in the middle of the show. He did. Because he wanted you. And it was his message of letting people know, I'm a believer. Now, he wasn't going to chapter and verse you and try to turn you off. But if you listen, I, I always challenge people, especially Elvis fans or people that aren't Elvis fans, listen to any Elvis song, then listen to a gospel song. You can hear the difference because his heart, and, I mean, he put his heart and soul in everything he ever did. But when you hear that gospel, that's why he got three Grammys for his gospel. I mean, you listen to that stuff. And you can feel the conviction in his voice. You hear it. I mean, I, I get tears in my eyes listening to it now because it's just so powerful the way he sings. He's, you know, he's saying it. It's just, wow. If you never got to see him in, on, in person, it, is, it was a completely, it was almost like a religious experience seeing. And I mean, he realized that. And that's why he started, he injected the gospel songs into it because he wanted people Okay, you're all freaking out. I'm going to give you something to freak out about. They do those gospel songs. But they were so wrapped up in what he was doing that they, they missed the message. It just went over their heads. He's up there sharing his faith with you. And that was his ministry, was his music. He took it literally when it says in the Bible that you're supposed to love everybody. And that, that was his message. Love everybody. Even your enemies. Yes. Elvis. <laughs> I'd hang my head. Oh, that's hard. He said, it may be, but that's what you got to do. Okay. He was a man, he was curious, especially when it comes to God and philosophies and stuff like this. He was very curious. And yeah, he picked up Larry Geller, introduced him, gave him some books and stuff like this, which he read, but then he put them away, got rid of them because it all come back to this. If it doesn't align with the Bible, then I'm not going to be a part of it. That, it, that was it. Now I got to ask one favor. I see, I noticed you wear a hat. Just I, I saw, can I put my hat on? Please. Okay. Look at that. All right. TCB. I feel like an outlaw. <laughs> when he was a teenager living here in Memphis, he would sneak down and there was some, there was a church, a, a black church down on Beale Street. And he would go into the black church and watch it. And they move around when they're singing gospel songs. And that's where he got it from. It wasn't copying it, but he felt it. Just one of the perfect examples of Elvis and music, because everybody talks about, oh man, he shot the TV set because Robert Goulet. 
the, the, and the, and the story is, the real story to that is, we were in Vegas and there was a daytime TV show on where various artists that are performing in Vegas would come on this TV show and they'd do a song or two. So Elvis was sitting there and he was watching it and he just clicked. And I went, oh, oh. <laughs> he shot the TV set. And I just, whoa, what was that? He said, the guy's all technique and no heart. He, he, Elvis could not stand an entertainer to get up there and just fake it. You, it's got to come from your heart. What you got to put all your heart and soul into what the songs that you sing. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to Elvis's song, Paul Simon was a perfect example. He went to the Madison Square Garden in 1972 and Elvis did Bridge Over Troubled Waters. He started crying and they talked to him. They said, that's the way the song should have been done. Because when he sang a song, I, when I was growing up and when he would be listening to the various songs, that he, the early stuff and the movie stuff, he wasn't really crazy about that music at all. It was just, but when he started performing live again, he would hear various songs, just like Bridge Over Troubled Water. Now he would play the song all day. And I walked in on him one day and there was nobody around. I was wondering what was going on. And he said, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just listening to some music. Oh, okay. I said, can I sit with you? And he said, yeah. I sat there for probably about two hours. And I, after about two hours, I just went, okay, I'm tired of hearing this. I said, so what is that? What do you, he said, I call it living with the music, Billy. I said, what does that mean? He said, I get it in my head. I, I visualize the song in my head and if you listen to Paul Simon's version of it, then you listen to Elvis's version. He keeps it true to the, what the artist originally meant for it to be, but he changes it because he arranged it in his head to fit him. And that's what he, that's what he called living with the song. So after that first experience, it's anytime else, unless it was a really good song, <laughs> oh, okay, I gotta go now. I'll see you later. <laughs> but I mean, like steamroller blues. James Taylor. My brothers and I introduced him to that song. We were playing in at the basement in Graceland one night and he walks, he comes downstairs. Who's that? And we said, that's James Taylor. What's that song? It's called Steamroller. He played it again. And we played it. He played it again. So we played, ended up playing it for him three times. Yeah. I like this song. He said, yeah. Thanks boys. And we didn't know that he was going to turn around and record it, do it live. Yeah. But that's how, yeah. Now, as far as Elvis music, because my brothers and I, as we got older, the influence, especially when he came back doing live performances, it, he listened to a lot of the stuff that we played. He knew who Led Zeppelin was. And in fact, Led Zeppelin, they met him on tour and in their box set, they said, we want to thank Elvis' stepbrothers for playing our music to him. Hmm. So we, he heard Led Zeppelin, Eric Clapton. We, I, we got to meet Eric Clapton, even a kiss. Of all people, and Leonard Skinner. Now everybody says kiss, and I go, yeah. There was a song. I was, I had a date, and I was down in the basement at Graceland playing Kiss Alive. And the song, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, comes up. So I'm playing air guitar. I got it cranked up because it was a great sound system down there. And he must have heard it, and he comes downstairs, and I, hey, Elvis. And my girl I was with said, I'm not falling for that. And then Elvis says, hey, Billy. Oh, she's, she turned around. He said, what is that you're listening? I said, it's called Kiss. And it's the song is Let Me Go Rock and Roll. He said, Kiss. I hand him the album cover. And he just looks at it. Okay. I get it. Keep it simple. Stupid. Okay. I got it. He said, they can take their make, makeup off and they can walk around. And nobody knows who they are. Said, yeah. But he loved what Ace Frehley was doing with the guitar work, which was actually a 50s guitar groove. On steroids is all that's what he said he said that's what we were doing back in the 50s i said like, what and he said listen to it billy and i saw like, yeah you're right it, it is but yeah he got all the big artists back in the day and that was one of the great things about being elvis's brother we went to a lot of concerts now david would knew jerry jerry weintraub which was you know he later became a famous movie producer and all that stuff like that he was working for Concerts West, I think. He said, how come he, he said, how come you're not with Led Zeppelin and all these other bands? He said, David, I make more money on one night 
with Elvis than these guys do in a week. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Because, see, my brothers and I, we didn't really see Elvis as everybody else did. They saw this great superstar. We just knew him as a brother. In fact, the only time I learned who he was as I was growing up, the process, he made sure the process was really slow. It wasn't immediately who he was. So. But it was in 1969 when he came back and he did Las Vegas for the first time. I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to Woodstock. But they said, no, the family vacation, we're doing Vegas with Elvis. I, okay. So I was sitting there, I'm looking around and going, man, this is not going to be nothing but old people here. And I'm looking around and I see all these, all different age groups. And I'm going, wow, this might be pretty cool. And I've seen all these celebrities going, wow. He comes out and does the first song. I think I took one breath during the whole show. I'm going, I'm looking at my brothers. Who is this guy? <laughs> We've never seen this guy before. We seen the, the, the actor and stuff, but the only other time I got to see him before was in 1961, but I was only eight years old and I didn't understand it. And I didn't really hear anything because there was too much screaming and stuff. In Vegas, 1969, and that's when I went. Now I know why they call him the king. Because that was the show I'd ever seen in my life. Still, and I've seen a lot of bands. So I called this episode as Elvis is Alive. Yeah, May 19th, 2018. It was just a normal day. I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd had chest pains all week long, but I didn't know what a heart attack was. So I'm 65 years old. And I'm just, I'm sitting there watching TV with my brother, David. I said, I think I'm going to take a nap. And the next thing I know, I'm standing, it looks like I'm standing on clouds. And I, it's the brightest light I've ever seen in my whole life. And I start, in fact, it was so bright. I started looking for the source just to see where it was coming from. But there was, there is no, you don't see a light source. It's just bright. Then I started looking around and I saw all the, I've never seen that many people before in my life. It was like, when you see pictures, if you were standing in the middle of Woodstock and you looked around, yeah. it's the only thing I could compare it to. I've never seen that many people that was just from one side to the other. And I was just, wow. And the first thing I felt all of a sudden was this overwhelming sense of love. Love so strong that it made you feel that you felt like you were glowing. That's how strong this love feeling is. And I just took it all in. And a boy, I saw a city that had all, the best, only way I can describe it, it had a wall, but the top of it had this golden hue from, coming from it. A boy said, that's where you're supposed to go. So I took a small step because, like I said, it looked like clouds, and I wanted to make sure I could walk. I saw that I could. So I, I looked at the city, and I started walking. Now, the, the strange thing about it was as I was walking, the people were moving. I couldn't walk up to them. It, it was like they were moving away as I was walking toward them. And then I see a figure, in the he's got his back to me. And I, as I get close to him, I, I'd say maybe five feet, six feet away from him. He turns around and it's Elvis. And he says, great to see you, but he did Now, the great thing about it in heaven is you, they, they don't speak with their mouth. You can hear their thoughts. And he reaches forward like this and I walk up to him and he gives me a hug and pats me on the back. And I said, it's great to see you, Elvis. And then all of a sudden, it, I started getting a little scared because just as that happened, it was like the old cartoons, how they would close in. It was just getting dark. And I was looking at his face and it, it was, the darkness was closing in around his face. He said, tell my family, my friends and fans, I love them. I'll see them when they get here. I said, okay. Then I heard another voice just before Doc said, no doubt, no fear. Now I knew that was God. No doubt there is a heaven and no fear. This is where you're going to be. And the great thing about when God talks to you, he doesn't have to explain anything. I knew immediately what he meant by that. No doubt, no fear. But there's that one stipulation that comes with it, that you have to believe with all your heart and soul that Jesus came and died for your sins. And that's all it is. I came to, and I'm laying on the floor, and my ribs were hurting real bad because Liz's daughter, that's my wife, her daughter, had, only, had seen a video on CPR of the week before this happened. And she'd been doing CPR and doing the compressions and stuff like that. 
Uh, I, I was, as when I come to, I was, okay, what am I doing laying on the floor? And I got to get up. I got to go to the bathroom. They said, no, the paramedics are on the, up, on the way up the stairs. What had happened is I had suffered a heart attack, stroke, and seizure. I was dead for 10 minutes, but it seemed people said, oh, it turns, man, that seems like a long, I was only there. It felt like seconds. So there, you have no sense of time at all. Heaven is not a strong enough word to describe how beautiful and how peaceful it really is. When I walk here on earth and stuff like that, I, I walk a little fast, but there I was just, I was very slow and just relaxed. The most calming feeling I've ever felt in my life. But that overwhelming sense of love is the first thing that hits you. It's just like, oh my God, you've never felt that kind of love before in your life. And it just, like I said, it makes you feel like you're glowing. And the thing is, and I didn't tell anybody about this for probably about a month and a half. And I kept praying to God, what am I supposed to do with this? And finally, that same voice that told me, no doubt, no fear, said, you're supposed to tell everybody, Billy. <laughs> oh, okay. I got it. And that's another reason why the book, The Faith of Elvis. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's why I called it Elvis is Alive. And uh, yeah. when we're both there someday, you can introduce me to Elvis. He'll, trust me, if you go before me, he'll come up and say hello to you. Because all your loved ones and every people you don't even know, they are all so glad to see you when you get there. I saw these people. I couldn't make, I, I could see all the different skin colors and hair colors, but I couldn't make out their faces. But I could see a little bit of a smile on everybody's face. And it was like, it's a big welcoming party when you get there. Yeah. So everybody's just sitting there. I'm surprised they weren't going, hey, we get here. Hey, you made it finally. <laughs> but it changed my life. That changed my life because as a Christian, and I've been one since I was 13, 14 years old. There was always just that little bit of doubt. Is it real? I want to believe it. I want to believe it. And I, I did believe it. I always have. But then when God showed it to me, I went, okay, I got it now, God. I got yeah. it. It's real. And I tell everybody, it, it's as real as me sitting here talking to you right now. Yeah. That's how real it is. And it is the greatest place ever. You have a brother that's now an evangelist? Yeah, Rick. Now, Rick passed away in 2019, the day before Elvis's birthday. He was a preacher. He worked with Billy Graham, and, and David became a minister also. Now, he's no longer in the ministry, but you know, he's thinking about getting back to it. But and I was the last one to come on board with it. And in fact, my brother, because I was baptized, when, like I said, when I was 13 or 14, but I didn't re really truly understand what it was all about. My brother Rick baptized me. And gosh, it's like 79, 1979, because then I understood who God was. I really had a better understanding at that, at that age, I was like 26 years old and he baptized me. And it, it, it's just funny how God moved in our lives, how differently our lives changed after Elvis passed, when he passed away. For me, the lesson I learned was there's no guarantee for tomorrow. That's why when I tell, I talk to people I love and stuff like that, friends and stuff, I'll tell them I love them because I'm not going to get that chance again. So I better let them, I want to know how I feel right now, as opposed to, I wonder how, no, I'm going to tell you how I feel right now. There may not be another tomorrow, but as long as you believe, but the, the biggest thing is uh, the things that I've learned since then is a lot of people like watching your show and stuff. They may be praying for answers and stuff, and they're going, is God going to answer my prayer? When a stranger walks up to you and tells you something that you've been praying about, that's God talking to you. It's like Gil was said, God is always talking to you. He's knocking on the door, but are you going to, are you going to open it? So he's always talking to you. And, I, and I, that's what I tell people is, but Billy, it's so hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard to follow what the Bible says. But man loves to make it so much more complicated than it really is. If you just, if you believe this with all your heart and soul that Jesus came and died for your sins, guess where you're going? You're going to heaven. Because it's not your deeds that get you there. Elvis is a perfect example. What he didn't get him there, it was his belief. Because it, even in his deepest, darkest periods of his life is when he would turn that, open that Bible up. And he knew that's when I needed the Lord right now. 
And that, that he was a, he read that Bible every day. He immersed himself in it. But like I said, that inner battle that's you, you got the devil on one side and God on the other, and that battle zone is in your head. And when you get these, the urges and all these things, it's, that's when you say, okay, God, I'm leaving it up to you. Help me. Yeah. That's all. It, he's waiting for you to say that. Just help me. I said, he will. All you got to do is ask. Hey, Billy, in closing, if someone came to you had never heard of Elvis Presley, what would you want them to know about Elvis Aaron Presley? He was, first off, he was probably one of the, the finest Christians I ever met, and he was also a great entertainer. That order. Uh, here's Elvis signing all these checks, and you look at the expression on his face is he's not happy with because now you're bringing the attention to him doing this. No, I'm doing this because I love people. He used to do this every year where he would write out, write 50 checks for $1,000 each to all these different various charities. And they took a picture of him once and he's looking up and he's not real happy because he's not happy because you're bringing attention to him. He didn't want the attention for that. I'm yeah. doing this out of the goodness of my heart. I'm not doing it for any other reason. I don't want recognition for this. Even these stories that I share, he didn't do it for publicity or he was doing it out of the goodness of his heart. And, but, and that's why I share a lot of those stories in the book is because it, I want everybody to have a better understanding of who this, what, what they say, the greatest entertainer of all time, what he was really all about. And that's what, that's what it's all about is, yeah, he did all this, those great things as far as business-wise, but he did far more greater things in his personal life as, as far as a Christian. And that's what people need to know. He, he was not ashamed of who, that he was a Christian dog. No. He wanted to let people know he was, but do it in a way that would be acceptable instead of forcing it. That's the problem with a lot of Christians is they try to force that on somebody. And you, you, that's not how you do it. You do it when somebody asks you for it and then say, okay, and share it in a way that makes, that they will understand and want to know more instead of, no, you got to do this and this, and you hammer it down on them. Nobody can do that. There was only one that could, and that was Jesus. You just be the best person you can be and believe. It's that simple. And go to church. Yeah. Find a good one. Several years to find a good church. One that preaches from the Bible, because right. I've been to a few that Oh yeah, we, we, we love you and we'll pass the plate around, but we're not going to say anything about the Bible or Jesus or anything. Okay. That's enough. <laughs> but they'll put on a good Vegas style show. There you go. We'll remember that kid. And that's a good one. <laughs> Counting among the outlaws, he said, come follow me. People from all walks of life since have been becoming outlaws.